Hello and welcome to Begging the Question, the show where you ask the questions and we give the answers. I'm Dan Vaughn. I'm joined by my co-host. Here's one, Dan Creel. What's up, buddy? Uh, Nothing much. Good to be here. Episode number two of Begging the Question. Uh, I'm ready for the question. Yeah, we're gonna beg. So, so what you're saying is you're begging. <laughs> you're begging for the question. I'm begging for the question. Yes. Makes yeah. sense. Makes yeah. sense. It's good to stay that you stay on theme there. I appreciate okay. that. Well, let's walk up our second co-host, the third, ho- I, whatever. Anyway, John Howard Fusco, what's up, buddy? How's your day going? Oh, even then, even then. I'm already sweating. I'm already nervous about the question, so. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I I love it. I want you guys to, to be afraid. It's always fun when it, you are, um, though you guys are the best, but. Do Keith here from El Paso, Texas. I work with Locomotive FC and back in the day, quite a few years with these cats. Every weekend, all across the Sun City and public parks throughout the city, scenes like this are playing out. I want to point out it's over 100 degrees right now at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they're still going. And it's a city that plays the game, maybe more than any other particular sport, at whether that is private leagues, public leagues, pickup games, all over the city. And we see that. There's talent here. Alex and Dejas Club America. PSV Eindhoven's Ricardo Pepe, both from El Paso. I would argue that the, the beautiful game is the sport that El Paso plays more than any other. And it stands to reason, if you look at the obvious demographics, a city that's over 85% Hispanic, where people grow up with the ball at their feet and on their TV screens, making Liga MX the most watched league in all of the United States. It stands to reason that we would see a lot more representation of Latinos in the sport in the United States, but we don't for economic disparity reasons, for other reasons. We all know, I think, and would agree that the club to college mindset, that phrase, club to college, is made up of two words that have always been the wrong words. It used to be before Locomotive FC that kids would have to leave if the very talented kids like Pepe and Zendejas would have to go to FC Dallas's academy to get a shot. Before FC Dallas leaned into its academy, it was the El Paso Patriots, and that was about it. Which begs the questions. Do you see the proliferation of professional and semi-pro clubs, NPSL, UPSL, USL League 2, League 1, Championship, Major League Soccer, do you see that changing this equation in any appreciable way, how much or how little? And most importantly, the biggest question, what would you do to change it if you could? Three easy spot kicks for you right off the bat, huh? Good luck. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. El Paso legend, yeah. Duke Keith, the voice you hear if you're watching the El Paso locomotive. And uh, he's been around for a while, as you can tell from his El Paso Patriots hat. Um, I'm sure that, that, that belongs in a museum. It belongs um, in a museum. <laughs> but, but not Duke Keith. He doesn't belong in a museum. Uh, so Duke asked, well, I, he, he kind of, and it, even when he sent me the question, he was like, I'm nervous that I might have gone too long there. And I say, Duke, I can listen to you talk all the time, buddy. It's like listening to, you know, your your uh, your uncle talk about something. He knows what he's talking about. But he talked about uh, club to college. He talked about the expansion and proliferation of, of amateur and semi and professional clubs across the across the country and how that affects the sort of path to pro or the, the way in which um, talents developed. Um, and then he talked about how would we change it? I'd like to start off because I, I expect we're going to move away from this area. So I want to make sure that I plant my flag first and say that I have always had a problem fundamentally with the way in which college soccer operates in this country. I do not like it. Uh, I've never been a fan of it. I do think it's paid off for the women's game, and I'll be, I'll, I will be—I want to make sure that I mention that. It definitely has paid off. Due to Title IX, college soccer has been a way in which universities have expanded opportunities in sports for women, and, and that's a good thing. And I, and I want to be clear on that, that if we can't get investment – outside of college then then sort of the artificial incentivization of universities to open up these spots for women to play soccer that's a great thing and i and it's paid off I, in fact i would argue that our superiority in women's soccer is because we have a head start that was that basically happened because of title nine because it sort of opened up 
you know, all these opportunities for young women to, to get a chance to play soccer and develop their skills. And that sort of created this pressure on the other end of, of the collegiate game where they, now they need a place to go after that. And so it's created this need for professional soccer. And I think overall that has paid off, but on the men's side, I feel like, and and I've always had a problem with the over focus on sports in universities. And I would argue that, that this is not just college soccer that I'm talking about. It's, it's every sport in college and it creates weird aspects of universities because they're focusing on sports rather than on academics. And of course, leave it to the chubby nerd to complain about (laughs) uh, college sports being, we're not focusing on the right thing here. But I would argue that if you want to play a sport and you want to develop your talent, there are established ways and methods to do that, particularly in in soccer. And I don't, to me, college is a weird sort of break off the path that that doesn't need to exist and shouldn't exist particularly for the men's game i've always had a problem with that and i i know that there are people that are big fans of college soccer i I don't think any of the three of us are but i i i I could be wrong about that maybe there's a secret college soccer um uh sycophant here that i'm not aware of and i certainly hope so and i would also say i don't have time for it considering all the rest of the soccer we're forcing you to watch uh but but so just just to say that that i'm not a big fan of that on the other hand the proliferation of youth sports and youth soccer is something that i think we've seen an explosion of in the last 25 30 years across the country and you know the 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 people that he cites the ricardo pepe's the zendejas of the world that are were forced to go to fc dallas there are we're beginning to see now youth programs stepping in at a local level to kind of give those kids opportunities to develop their talent and to move on so i i just wanted to throw that out there that i hate college sports and that 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 all of your angry letters to Dan Creel. That's my last name. Don't mm-hmm. think about anything else. The other Dan, that's who you need to complain to. But I, I let me throw it to you guys. John, I, Duke threw out a bunch. Where where are you grabbing onto this tiger? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a that's a, a huge, huge subject. And it's one that's been talked about an awful lot. How do we develop how do young players get a chance, an opportunity to develop and, and play soccer in this country? Um, where we do things just very differently from the rest of the world, uh, where soccer has become expensive. Uh, it requires a lot of travel, uh, you know, especially if you become, if you're a child who becomes more of an, recognized as an elite player and you go on travel teams, it, it becomes a bigger burden in terms of travel, in terms of cost, uh, uh, it, exp- you know, time, you know, your expense with your parents, you know, the amount of time the parents have to be involved in it in order to do the traveling. Um, I hear a lot on social media about this, about, about this issue of the cost and pay for play and, and all those kind of stuff. And you look at some of the top players around the world and they didn't develop in a system like that. Um, they were recognized at an early age and they were brought to academies uh, and develop that way. You know, we're not, we're just, we're not there yet. It's that, that's not what we do. You know, it's, it's the thing we always have to look at with, you know, American sports played in America versus the rest of the world is that we just tend to do things differently. We just have different mindsets of things. And one of the big things, as you, as you talked about before is college, you know, that's something that just doesn't exist in the rest of the world. They don't have this level of, uh, interest and, uh, attention brought to college sports. Um, the way that we do even college soccer, which is not considered one of the big college sports, uh, but it has a, has a considerable following and, uh, and it dictates how clubs, uh, you know, have these players on their teams and they can only have them certain times of the year. Um, We have leagues that specifically revolve around the few months that college players are eligible to play amateur soccer outside of their college team. Um, the rest of the world doesn't they don't deal with issues like that. That that would never come up. Um, so there's a lot of layers to this. I mean, that is an awful lot of layers to this. But I think the first one that I hear more often than not is the whole pay to play thing, where it the expense of it can be a barrier to entry. 
Um, you know, think of think of all the players, the top players around the world historically, who came from very very poor disadvantaged backgrounds, who would essentially have not gotten an opportunity if they played in the United States because their parents couldn't have afforded something, where they may say, "No, we, we just can't do it." Um, so I think that's that's the first area to look at. You know, how do we how do we create a system that doesn't uh, have such an expense? Uh, to, to just to play um, where around the world, you know, you have a ball, you have an open space, you can figure it out, you know? <laughs> uh, so I, 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 I know that I, I'm slowing the conversation and the progress because I want to go back to it, but I would argue that college soccer <laughs> has slowed the development of the amateur game because of exactly what you said, John is that it limits the availability of young men who would normally be playing and developing their talents in an amateur league, and instead they're spending time in college. And so because of that, it's limiting their availability. I just wanted to say that. Now, secondarily, um, to get to move to move beyond my hang-ups with college soccer, which, by the way, I'm confident I'm going to get plenty of hate for. I'm very confident. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's coming. Yeah, yes. Uh, <laughs> but what I was going to say is that I have a daughter who plays club soccer and uh, I had a friend of mine encourage me to get her into a city league. And I thought in my head that city and club was the same thing. Effectively. That is not the case. City league is significantly cheaper than club soccer. Club soccer is year around, which is interesting because my daughter is seven. And so she is playing basically uh, she has, she has practiced two days a week plus typically on Saturday she has matches and so so basically three days a week she's she's playing soccer and the cost on that is around a hundred bucks a month towards coaching but then on top of that it is uniforms which I spent almost four hundred dollars on I think it was a little over four hundred dollars on uniforms this was for one season's uniforms by the way um and 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 then anytime there is a tournament that say outside of El Paso, and in, in this case, um, Las Cruces, which is up the road in in New Mexico, uh, it's another seventy five, eighty, one hundred dollars, and we have to cover the travel to there. I know that the age group that's I think two years older than my daughter recently took a trip to San Diego, and the parents were expected to cover all the travel costs. Not to mention the also the registration fee. Like, yeah, pay to play is. I, I mean, my daughter would not be playing soccer. I mean, she might be playing soccer in the backyard, uh, but she would not be playing on a team if it wasn't for the fact that my wife and I have decided to make this an economic like sacrifice on our part to help fund this. But a hundred percent, pay to play is a problem in the United States, and how many kids are exiting the sport? Or, or at least not ever getting into the pathway up simply because a parent can't afford to get them into a club team that might offer them opportunities to develop and then expose themselves to people that, that might make the connection to move them off into um, a, be a better place for them to play. Dan, sorry, I know I'm going to stop talking about club soccer. You're welcome to bring it back up and I'll find something else to talk about. What do, what do you got to say? Um, boy, all, all of that. Um, just think of, I don't it's hard to know where to start. I thought I knew where I was gonna, where I'm going to start and now I'm kind of uh, struggling. Um, I will start here, just make, make a, make a kind of blanket statement. Americans, America, we love to have unpaid labor period. Like if we don't, if we, if we don't have to pay for labor that makes other people money, we will do it. And if, if you want to balk at that, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about college sports, which is a multi-billion dollar industry built on the backs of <laughs> unpaid labor, massive unpaid labor, right? So it's kind of maybe changing now, but um, high school sports in Texas, Dan Bond, ma like massive and industry. And mm -hmm. these are teenagers. These are kids playing for schools and you, they have these huge stadiums, they're a bunch of money. So uh, two, two things for me what I'm going to go down is the context of soccer as a sport in the U S compared to other sports in the U S soccer is not the, is not unlike baseball, unlike gridiron football, unlike basketball, unlike baseball, that's changing. Um, 
basically that is the biggest sport here in the U.S. If you want to play those sports, hockey, if you want to play those sports, you have to come here. We're not really exporting any of that, right? It, it's here. We're the best. And we're the greatest. And if, if you don't play here, well, too bad. Soccer is not that way. We're not the destination, the major destination, right? So um, the talent, players, coaches, um, front office, whatever. If, ta- if, they, if there's talent here and it's not getting paid, they can go somewhere else. There's tons of places where we're going to get paid better. So I think that's one issue with, with kind of the U.S. system. Um, we just don't, I, I think Americans don't, don't like having that being not at the top, right? And so we kind of like brush it off. I want us to go back to kind of where Duke was talking about, El Paso, Texas, uh, the border states, like California, huge Hispanic populations. Here in D.C. has a massive Hispanic population. Think about it. If if you don't have a ton of money, which most of us don't, and you were talking about it, if you want to play in this structure, the main, and we're, I'm going to get to this in a second, the main structure, mainstream structure of, is of especially youth soccer is this play to place, play, pay to play system, which costs parents tons of money. If you are a uh, Latinx family, um, for instance, you have a whole community of soccer around you. You don't need to go to this pay to play system most athletes, even the best athletes don't make money or they make very little money and they don't hit. So why would you go through a system where you are literally paying hand and foot to play when you could just get better kind of as, as good or maybe even better kind of um, uh, a competition within your community, community leagues, Hispanic, Latino community leagues all over this country are outside of the system and they're doing their thing. And, and I know and, and Dan, you know this, and I'm sure it's in New Jersey too. There are kind of local cups of mm-hmm. these mostly Hispanic teams, and mm-hmm. there are tons of money. And if you're a good player who's, you know, has to work a job, you can play on these teams. The team rounds up some money, a few hundred dollars, pay it. And if you win, you get thousands and thousands of dollars to share. Think about that as a kid growing up and their parents is like, um, why would you enter this system where you have to spend a ton of money, which you don't have, and you get you get into college and then again, maybe you're spending money. Right. Um, uh, I, I, I think I'll stop for a second, but <clears throat> I think something that Americans, we just don't wrap our head around. We completely forget about it, that there's this whole ecosystem of soccer, which is super mature outside the soccer pyramid doing their own thing. And they're content to do it. And they're happy to watch uh, Liga and Mekis, and maybe they go to their family in Mexico and maybe they play semi-pro or professionals there, right? When they're in college age here, um, there are outlets for them that make much more competitive sense and fiscal sense. Why would they, you know, why do we assume that we have to find them and we're missing out and if we bring them in, they'll just come in. Like they, they probably, for a lot of these players and families, they have a better deal outside of the system that, that, that we have built up mainstream is built up. Um, and they probably don't want to pay all this money to do this kind of probably in their, in, in their view, inferior product. Well, I think that we've all sort of identified pay to play as a sort of, and, and uh, no, no duh, right? Like everyone, everyone would know this, right? That pay to play is clearly a barrier and it's a barrier that has been around for a long time and continues to be around a long time. If I think that, and certainly Duke mentioned it, that it's been a, I I think, a gatekeeping mechanism that has kept a lot of people of color from participating in a sport. And if you're talking about Latinx community, a, a community that loves the game and naturally plays the game. And so because of that, you would think you would encourage these people into the sport because they're probably coming in at a higher level, uh, more ready to play. And instead we're finding ways now in a place like El Paso that's 85% um, um, Hispanic or Mexican-American, the reality is that my daughter's soccer team is full of Mexican-American kids. That's just the truth. My daughter is also Mexican-American at some level. Um, Well, at a half level, I guess, would be the correct way of saying that. So so I hear that. Let's sort of address the other or, or one of the other parts of Duke's question, which was what does the sort of changing landscape of american soccer the addition of 
because we have a lot of levels of soccer now, and he he listed some of them off, and we can there's even levels that he didn't list that we could. I mean, he didn't mention MLS Next Pro, uh, but there's of course USL League One, there's NISA, there is um, uh, amateur soccer in in USL League Two, NPSL, UPSL, and we know the, the variety and hosts of of amateur um, regional leagues that are scattered all across the country that we talk about on the protagonist podcast called Root and Branch. Sorry, I got to plug that. Uh, so there is a lot of soccer happening that maybe 20 years ago, we certainly would have less opportunity to be de- de- developing talent. Duke's question is, is how has that changed? And my question is, do you feel like it's changed? I, I would I would argue that particularly at the USL championship, the MLS level, probably League One level, we're seeing academies begin to pop up around those clubs. I know for a fact that the USL system encourages that, wants to see more academy programs start up uh, to give opportunities to both locate talent, to grow their fan base, to connect with the local community. There's a lot of big pluses for the academy system, and the USL has made it a big focus point. They talk about it a lot. Uh, so the ask is, is do we see that changing things? Maybe, maybe it's not changing yet. Is it, is it beginning to change? Are we starting to see a change? Uh, John, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think, I think it, it is creating more opportunities. I think more academies are creating more opportunities. Uh, you are seeing players that maybe 10, 15 years ago would have never gotten to the pro ranks are now finding ways to getting into the pro ranks and moving up uh, because of added opportunities and more in you know, with, with league one and NISA, you know, you know, the division three uh, leagues now operating, albeit, you know, still pretty sparse, still pretty spread out, not a, not as robust a division three as, as this country could, could really have considering how, how large of a, of a country we are, you know, think about it between, Nisa and League One, what that's that's what twenty clubs or something, a country this size. We're, we're still very top heavy. We still have a very very large first mm-hmm. division, and lower divisions are just they should be bigger. I mean, uh, just to touch on what I mentioned last at last show, encouraging investment in the professional league. We, we've talked about that, you know, the professional league standards and all that. But we were top heavy. We need to be bigger at the bottom to really have a, a more functioning pyramid. But you are seeing players make start slowly making that move up so it's better is it great i would say we're far from great but it's better yeah i mean i I think the national club game is more mature than it's ever been like we have a big stable division one you may not like mls and kind of how it's structured and maybe how it how it um kind of goes about its business but it is the uh, uh, most stable, best national soccer league we we ever have had in this country, and mm-hmm. it does feel like Dan, the USL Championship is really starting to to. It, it does feel like it is a real national Division Two league, right? It feels like it's sure. kind of tipped over that balance. And Division Three, uh, you know, I, I cover US, USL League One, and and that is there's not enough teams, John. I agree, but it, it feels you see teams coming in and, and they have their own stadiums and they have great branding and marketing and, and resources and things like that. So, so that is, that is all good. That's, that's great. Like that's, that's, that's wonderful. And, and if, you know, we look back 10, 15, 20 years, we'd all love to see that um, uh, where we came from. There's a big butt now. coming right now. There is a big, there is a big <laughs> butt. There is a big butt. Um, I, I like big start, butts. I can't lie. Yeah. I mean, me either. Um, <laughs> I think the concern is, and it's, it, it kind of speaks to what Duke was asking about, is that we're creating a major league, minor league system, how we do in the U.S. Like, if you just take a step back, separate from the academies, which, which you know, is, is kind of part of the traditional soccer structure that you need to have, there's still the massive disconnect between those top one and two, kind of third level and everything else, which is going to l- still lose all this talent. It's not, it's not going to change we have a lot of small leagues. We have a lot of small clubs kind of doing their thing and in, in kind of small regional areas, it's working or not working. But I do worry, John, that, that it's, it's not going to catch 
like in other other countries is not going to catch you know local talent and and find them if they don't kind of happen to go down this really super narrow pathway in the u.s mm -hmm. that they manage to make it to the top and head out overseas right and maybe get caps captured by, by by mls um the 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 structure of soccer worldwide is very hierarchical it's just within a, a hierarchy it's just how it works here it's just a disjointed mess it, it's 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 not great it doesn't do the job it's supposed to and it hinders it, it, it hinders things another way and i do think that um we in the, in the u.s we do kind of think nationally when it comes to sports and it's got to get pushed up and then and then there's nothing there to fill in the bottom and 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 for, for other sports it is like high schools and colleges is that pathway and it works for them because that's the model with soccer I go back to it. There's too many options for people to go literally elsewhere outside of the U S um, that's a much better path for them. that's available to them to try to push themselves through this pathway through soccer. Or if they're a great athlete, why would you choose soccer? You know, you go football or baseball or something else, right? Where there's a better chance of making money. So it's, 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 it's not kind of a either or thing for me. It's not a binary. Like I think, cause I, we hear a lot, of, a lot of lower league fans kind of say like, Right, like uh, the the professionals game is terrible. No. Twenty twenty three, the professional game is better than it ever has been. Yes, much better. Per period. Yeah. You, you can quibble. About, you can have complaints about like the leagues and things like that, but the game itself is much much better situated now. Um, the, the big question is: Do we go down? Do we go down to the grassroots? Do we kind of build that connection? And I, the, the the federation seems agnostic to that. They don't want to care to create that bridge. And if you're not creating that bridge between this minor league system, and I'm going to say that use that term um, for this for this begging the question, and the grassroots systems, it's going to be a, it's going to continue to be a disconnected mess. And I don't think it's going to change all that much. It'll, it'll probably bubble up you know, more, but we weren't grow to the level of kind of the tradition, the major soccer countries. If, if we don't have a more holistic approach to soccer. So Duke asked if we could change anything. <laughs> we all had a magic wand or a, a magic lamp and we'd already wished for a million dollars and whatever else thing we'd wish for. Uh, what would we do to change things? How would we, what adjustments could we make that we, what will we tweak? Um, how would we fix it? I think that, I think that all of us would probably immediately submit pay to play, you know, some, some way to make access more affordable for everyone. Um, but how that's done exactly. I Duke didn't say we had to have, you know, a three point plan or anything, which is that I'm thankful for because <laughs> I yeah. don't have that. Uh, but, but I guess the question is what things, I mean, I would eliminate college soccer. I hate college soccer. And I was thinking one of the reasons why also is that by the time you're 18, which is when most people are going into college soccer, if, if you're playing soccer, you should already be playing for a club somewhere at 18. Like no, only in the United States would anyone delay from 18 to 22 to play college soccer. Like that's ridiculous. No, I mean, that, that's four productive years in any other country that you'd be expected to if you were a talented soccer player. Like they, I, I would seriously consider it a waste of talent. I, I totally understand the desire to get a college education, but it just does not make sense if you're going to be a professional soccer player to, to put four years of prime development in college so i limit i limit college soccer boom now I'm, now i've made even more people angry um <laughs> which i'm all here for uh, uh any any thoughts from you all any any um uh magic bullets uh silver bullets there's, there is no magic bullet this is it's it's too it's a it's an issue that has too many levels to it the thing that i would change and you, and you talked about mentioned earlier about the federation being kind of agnostic um, I would really like to see a change in thought process and vision of leadership at the Federation. Um, we just seem to be kind of just doing the same things over and over and over and over again. Um, but I really like to see a change in, in, that, in, that, in the thinking of the Federation in terms of wanting to create a more all-encompassing system 
um, or we're just really just to be more clear about how we want this to go, um, where instead of just simply having the leagues just do their own independent thing and just hope for the best, uh, but really try to have a, a clear vision of, of, of what we want to do uh, as, a, as a soccer nation. Um, because all the other little things, you know, we could sit there and debate these things for hours and hours and hours, how to fix everything else. But, uh, but there, there, needs to be better, there needs to be more clear leadership at the top in terms of, you know, no, I, don't, I just don't feel like anyone's ever thinking really big picture. I, I, just, I just feel like it's all just addressing the immediate issue here and the immediate issue there. Uh, but no one's taking a much broader view uh, and how, how that would look. Uh, especially with the notion of, of, of amateur to amateur to pro, um, you know, people who talk about pro rel, I just, I don't see where we create this conversion from amateur sides to professional sides yet. We're still far from really figuring that, that part of it out. Um, so, um, that would, that would, that would be my initial fix. It's just, we just need to have a, a, a different, broader vision of how this should, should work. John, I was going to say, Dan, I know that you had your answer already, but John brought up a good point. Pro rel is obviously the answer that fixes all the problems, doesn't no. it? Nope. Yeah, I mean, really, uh, I, I really should have just said pro rel. All and of and us should have said. My bad. I apologize, guys. Okay. I'm sorry. Nope. Sorry, Dan. Go okay. ahead. Um, I got I got three, and I'll be I'll be quick. Number Jeez. one, <laughs> I will blow up. I would blow up the USASA. I would just dismantle that. Not board. not literally, but you would disassemble it. Yeah, I disassemble it. I would theoretically blow it up. It's, he, was think, it's, he was thinking about that for a second. Yeah, I just think for a second. It'd be fun. It'd be fun. <laughs> um, you know, what that would look like, I don't know. But it, it's kind of a, it has, it's this weird power structure that keeps things from happening. Like John mm -hmm. was saying, I would give a lot more power down. I would push a lot more power down and, and not be afraid of that. But but we were white supremacist culture. We were afraid of that. Um, uh, uh, two... Um, this is I'm, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do an actual sane one at the end. This is kind of the wacky one. I would I would turn the, the country. I wouldn't have it one be. I would do like not the United Kingdom, Wales, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland. They each have national teams. I would do that with the U.S. I would break us up in some way, shape, or form, and and um, uh, we're, we're too big. The, the, the country is too big and too wieldy. We should we should think more along kind of regional lines like that. It'd be great to have like. Four, three or four kind of like national teams in the US. We, we could do it, you know, if people would never go for it. Um, so here's my saying one. Here's kind of like nuts and bolts one. I would, I would in, if I was the USSF, I would invest in trade schools, soccer trade schools, create like maybe even uh, uh, work with uh, community colleges. Literal, like you want to, you, you don't, you, you want to play soccer, you want to be a coach, you want to be, you know, whatever. Um, you come, you, you take some classes, you learn about it, but we, this community college is going to have, or trade school is going to have a, a team that we pay the pay. You get to pay, you get two, you get two years and you go off and you apply your trade somewhere else um, to create that. You've got to create that Avenue for people who don't want to go to college and, and go that way, that it's, it's a trade. You treat it as such, right? Because right now you're basically saying you're a kid and you're never going to pay you and then become adult and you don't have to pay you at that point. Right. Cause we've used, we've used you up. Um, so that, that would be my one thing is I, I think, because I think academies is this traditional way of, you know, soccer culture. We don't have that here. And maybe you invest in like turning some community colleges, you create trade schools for, for soccer and that you kind of build it up in an Amer more American way. Maybe. I think that, and I'm, and I'm sorry for getting extra time here. I know I'm cheating right now, but I'm the host. I can do this. I think that fundamentally, like capitalist thinking about organizations like the like the US Soccer Federation or like USASA, it's not it should not be about making money. It should be about investing every cent into growing the game. That should be your goal. And so when there's a profit loss statement, and I understand that maybe they haven't been great lately, but you've been spending a lot of money on lawyers that'll do that to you. Um, no offense, Dan. Uh, but fundamentally we have to change the focus of the federation to growing the game when they handed all the da's over to mls why would we do that that's an awful idea 
you've basically you're handing over something that should be run by the federation a national organization that's built to grow the game you handed it over to people that only care about growing their own individual clubs why would they care about growing the game they don't they care about filling their own rosters it just bugs me anyway duke i hope we answered your question listener viewer i hope that you enjoyed us talking about it and if not well you know what beg another question that's it for this episode of begging the question we'll be back next week with more answers to your burning questions